Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion. So I'm a musician and independent artist, so music is something that's pretty close to me. Before Spotify, a small artist would have a very hard time distributing music to such a wide audience for free. But Spotify has changed all of that. The company started out as a simple enough idea, but managed to succeed where so many others failed. Spotify is now so influential that they basically have the power to decide who makes it in the music industry. So how did they become so successful? And moreover, how did an 18-year-old kid from Sweden do all of this? You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Our Spotify story begins in 1999. An 18-year-old kid by the name of Daniel Ek was living at home with his parents in Sweden. During daily life, Daniel's parents began to notice something strange. The young man kept bringing in large expensive TVs. His parents thought, there's no way our son could afford this. Has our dear son turned to a life of crime? In reality, it was something a little different. See, when Daniel was 13, around 1994, he had recognized the potential of creating websites for the fledgling internet. So he started a small home business making websites for clients. He charged his first client $100, but then charged the next client $200. The price was still below the industry average, so as demand for internet websites began to explode, soon Daniel could charge $5,000 per website. To help expand the business, Daniel recruited students from his computing class. He successfully bribed them with the promise of video games. His earnings would eventually reach $50,000 per month, and by age 18, he was managing a team of 25. His parents only noticed his earnings when he started bringing home those large TVs. As time progressed, the internet began to see the growth of downloading music illegally. Napster is enabling millions of people to get free music with just a few keystrokes at their computers. You're talking about revolutionizing the way we use computers and how we use the internet. Oh, absolutely. Revolutionizing. No, absolutely. I mean, it... And we're just beginning. Oh, absolutely. Because you just started this two years ago. <laughs> right. Since then, the world has changed for the Goliaths of the record industry, Sony, Universal, and others. The record companies say they will lose billions in sales because fans are getting their music for free, and they want fanning stopped. After Napster got shut down in 2001, other illegal sites such as LimeWire, Kazaa, and eDonkey2000 took its place. And for more obscure tracks, one could turn to SoulSeek to get their fix. Observing the trend, Daniel realized something. Later, in an interview, he states his realization. Quote, You can never legislate away piracy. Laws can definitely help, but it doesn't take away the problem. The only way to solve the problem was to create a service that's better than piracy and at the same time compensates the music industry. This idea was the basis for Spotify. After starting up some other companies and serving as the CEO of uTorrent till 2006, Daniel had made enough money, and he thought of retiring, but his entrepreneurial spirit drove him to do something else. During his entrepreneurial stints, Daniel would meet Martin Lorenzon. They bonded over both lacking purpose after amassing massive amounts of wealth unexpectedly. In 2006, while they were staying at a flat in Stockholm, Sweden, they were brainstorming ideas. As they worked, they would listen to music on their multimedia computer. In 2006, the experience was less than ideal. Internet radio hardly existed, and the listening experience of playing any track that they wanted spontaneously was frustrating to say the least. Then, an idea hit Daniel. Instead of leaving the concept of a legal streaming service to sit dormant in his head all these years, he could just go right out there and build it. Quote, We pretty much spent all of the autumn discussing a ton of ideas. I remember, however, that we sat around my media machine quite a lot and thought it was cumbersome to get content, despite the technology having been around since at least 2000. I think that's why we got stuck on the idea of Spotify. Okay, so they had this idea, but what were they going to call it? As the two founders were sitting in different rooms one day and exchanging different idea names for the brand, they would shout back and forth. Then Martin shouted a brand name to Daniel, which was misheard as Spotify. As soon as he heard the name, or rather misheard it, Daniel googled it, and once he found no matching results, they registered that for the name of their company immediately. 
2006 was an interesting time for music. The music industry itself was struggling. Sales of physical media such as CDs had fallen considerably over the past few years, and the record labels themselves seemed to have no solution. By 2006, music industry revenue had fallen from 25.2 billion in 1999 to just 19.4 billion. The real brilliance of Spotify's early core idea was market segmentation. They successfully identified and carved out a niche between two extremes in the music market. At one end were services like Napster, which were hugely popular but illegal. At the other end was Apple's iTunes, which sold songs individually for as much as $2 per track. The large area in between these two extremes is where Spotify would succeed. The pair wanted to make their music listening experience better than both of these. For Napster and similar services, it took minutes to download a single track, and pirated tracks were a luck of the draw when it came to audio quality. Not to mention that torrenting sites were also infested with malware and viruses. Around this time, Daniel would state, quote, I really believe that if we create the right product, which is better than piracy, people will come. On top of this market strategy, it was the user experience that made Spotify an instant hit. Audio quality would be high, but dependable. There would be instant playback and the interface would be snappy. A seamless experience was their goal, and the pair got to work to assemble a Spotify prototype. Now with some staff at their disposal, the new Spotify engineering team worked tirelessly to build a functional prototype of Spotify as quickly as they could. Daniel was obsessed with making Spotify lightweight and as responsive as possible. They couldn't be a delay of any kind more than 250 milliseconds. Daniel wanted Spotify users to feel as if they had every single song ever recorded right to their hard drives. Spotify had to be so good that users would happily pay $10 a month even though they could easily download torrents of their favourite music for free. It wasn't all smooth sailing though. The company spent years burning through cash while trying to secure music licences. Rather than acquiring global rights, which would be way too expensive, Spotify decided to stay focused on Europe. Daniel had some trouble with the label executives on the idea, but once the executives saw the product, they were blown away. Ironically, it took a custom build of the program loaded with pirated tracks to finally convince the record labels to sign up. The interface though was slick and worked without a hitch, so record labels, which were losing sales at the time, decided to play ball. After seeing the demo, Per Sundin of Universal Music Sweden would state, quote, This can't be true. It can't be this good. It's almost funny to look back on what a revolution this was back in the 2000s. The service went live on an invitation-only membership basis in Scandinavia, France, Spain, and the UK in 2008. The service expanded quickly, but international music license negotiations pushed the release date back for America. Spotify only made its way to the US in 2011, and it almost meant the end of the company's international debut before it even started. The big American labels like EMI, Sony, Universal, and Warner Music wanted to force a paid subscription model from the beginning, instead of a freemium model like Spotify wanted. Without the first deals from the labels, Spotify wouldn't have survived. Daniel offered the companies a majority share in Spotify stock. It was just enough to sweeten the deal. With falling sales, the record labels needed a way to get their music into the ears of young consumers. If the record labels didn't take this deal, pirate music would eat their profits. While they were focused on declining CD sales, the opportunity for digital music distribution was staring them right in the face, but they couldn't see it until Spotify forced them to. Once the major labels were on board, Spotify managed to receive major investment from banks such as Goldman Sachs. And after this, the rest was history. Today, Spotify has around 381 million active users monthly, of which 172 million are premium users. The platform has over 82 million songs. Today, songs are discovered on viral TikToks, but streamed in their entirety on Spotify. Spotify has also changed the way music is consumed. People don't listen to albums in order anymore. It's very common for people to be exposed to different songs through playlists. Playlists that are segmented by mood and theme. And these playlists can really give a boost to artists. With countless billions of streams under their belt, in a twist, 
If they choose, Spotify can bump whatever music they want to the top of the algorithm. Essentially, instead of music labels, they now have the power over the modern music industry landscape. And with this power also comes the side effect of censorship, but more on this later. Spotify is facing opposition from many artists. They see the platform as an unwanted middleman. While some artists feel that the payout from Spotify is inadequate, some others feel that the platform is not supporting enough for emerging artists. Taylor Swift was one of the first to speak out publicly. She complained about the low payouts for artists and called the whole platform an experiment. Quote, I'm not willing to contribute my life's work to an experiment that I don't feel fairly compensates the writers, producers, artists, and creators of this music. She subsequently took her music off the platform for three years before putting it back on. Other artists have done the same, but they always come back to Spotify. And this is a testament to just how much power the platform has. If you're an artist that actually wants to be seen and make decent money, Spotify is essentially the place that you have to be on. So, how much do people earn on Spotify? A recent comparison of rates found that, to earn $1 on Spotify, you need 229 streams. For Apple Music, this is 136 streams, and Tidal pays the best at just 80 streams. And the worst? YouTube Music, 570 streams. Censorship has also been a point of contention for those following the Spotify controversies, the most prolific of which happened with Joe Rogan. In 2021, Joe Rogan signed a $100 million deal with the company to be exclusive on the platform. After some controversial COVID episodes, Spotify deleted a bunch of Joe Rogan episodes and put disclaimers on many others. It most likely was an effort to keep external investors happy. And what else can be said? Money talks. Speaking of money, Spotify has been going on a buying spree mainly to boost podcasting on the platform. They've acquired both content and technology firms. Recent acquisitions include Gimlet Media, The Ringer, Anchor, Pods, and Megaphone. Essentially, they're playing both the demand and supply side. They provide and acquire podcasters and podcast networks and provide the technology to support that. The goal is to turbocharge its market share. And so far, it has really worked. Between 2018 and 2021, Spotify grew from 185,000 podcasts to 3.2 million. And, in October 2021, the company reported that it has more US listeners than Apple Podcasts, a significant milestone. In 2022, Spotify co-founder Daniel Ek has attracted some more attention from onlookers due to his investments. The most notable is an investment in the European defense AI startup, Helsing. In total, he pledged $1.2 billion of his own money to so-called moonshot projects. In his view, Europe needs a stronger tech scene, especially in AI. This is a far cry from anything to do with the music industry. So, how is it like for an artist to get on Spotify? Well, I've found that as long as the audio quality is decent and there's no blatantly offensive material, it's pretty simple these days. There are third-party distributors that basically do it all for you and upload pending Spotify's review. My last album, Nostalgia Dreams, was plain sailing just apart from the fact that someone ripped one of my demos straight from my second YouTube channel and called it their own and uploaded it to Spotify. To be honest, I'm not sure if there's many safeguards against stealing music. For me, I just managed to reach out to the guy and he took it down straight away. If you're a full-time musician, however, as shown by the earlier figures, it's hard to make a living on Spotify. Maybe that will change in the future, but we'll have to wait and see. In total, the story of Spotify is pretty insane. A couple of successful guys had an idea and decided to just run with it. Whether you love it or hate it, Spotify has flipped the music industry on its head and it's now an undeniable factor for any music success. For those of you who follow my music, I've just released a new album on Bandcamp called Hello World. It'll be on Spotify soon. Also, there's going to be an extended discussion of this topic on my podcast through the web. So check it out. I'll leave all the links below. Anyway, that is the story of Spotify. I hope you enjoyed it, or at least found it interesting. If you did, feel free to have a scroll or a browse through the channel. There's plenty of interesting stuff on here going years back. Anyway, my name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.